So it's time to start assembling. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel, love laser and CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest tips, tricks, tutorials and reviews. Now in today's episode, we are assembling all of this, the Saint Smart Genmitsu Prover XL 6050 plus now this is a beast of a machine it weighs nearly 60 kilograms and it all arrives in one box so do be careful if you're ordering this you want to make sure someone is there to help you move the box around now few things I will state, normally I unpack this as part of the video, but to be honest with you, I couldn't get the box in the workshop and still have enough space to unpack it. So I ended up unpacking it outside and bringing all the parts inside ready to assemble. The other thing I just want to quickly mention is do consider something like Loctite. This isn't essential, it's a bit of a soft glue for nuts and bolts, so it can just help hold everything together after you have assembled the machine. Put a couple of drops on every time you put a bolt in, and it'll just hold everything together nice and tight. Now for the purpose of today, we are following the instructions that come with the CNC machine. If anything can be improved in terms of the order of assembly, I will highlight this during the course of the video. And the final thing I want to point out before we get stuck in is take the time to go around and check the contents against the contents list in the actual instructions. Make sure you have every part, every nut and bolt. Also take the time to check every bolt that has already been installed is actually tight. It will save you so much time doing it now than trying to access some awkward bolts later on should you find something isn't quite correct. So do take that couple of minutes, just go around and check everything is tight. And then when all that is done, we can dive in and start assembling, which is exactly what we're going to do now. So pre-checks are all complete, and the first thing we want to do is install the Y-axis lead screw. Now there is a front and a back to the frame, obviously. The front has the Genmitsu writing on, the back has extra holes here where the Y-axis stepper motor will go. Now the lead screw also has a front and a back. The front has the shorter machine section, the back has the longer machine section, and also has a flat piece machined out of it. So what we're going to do is feed this through from the back, through the carriage to the front section here. Now on this carriage, there is a backlash nut and what this means, it is spring loaded. So as we feed the lead screw through and turn it, we want to apply some pressure to this backlash nut to ensure that it is applying pressure to the lead screw itself. So you will need to twist the lead screw and rotate it in and then apply pressure to the backlash nut to take it through the carriage and this will hold everything tight. Make sure that the lead screw is sticking out by quite a bit. Next you'll want to take one of the bearings, slide this over the small end, make sure it is sitting in there comfortably and then slide the carriage forward till the bearing goes into the seating hole. You then take the other bearing that comes with it, slide this over the opposite end and push that into place until it's sitting nice and tight. Next we're going to bring in the bearing fixing plate. There is a top and a bottom to this. The line indicates the bottom of the plate. There is also a front and a back. The larger hole goes against the blue plate. So place that in position and then bring in four M5 16 millimeter bolts to go in the outer holes. Position these in place and tighten everything up. Next, we're going to install the coupler. Make sure that the flat side of the lead screw is in sight, and this needs to align with the little set screw on the coupler. So we'll place those over, make sure it is in as tight as it can go, and then tighten up the little set screw so it is gripping that flat section that we just placed it over. You can then bring in the other Allen key to tighten up the clamping mechanism on the coupler, and again, make sure that is tight. Next, we are installing the Y-axis stepper motor, the gasket for it, and we're gonna do this using M5, M16 bolts with a flat washer and a spring washer. The spring washer goes on first, followed by the flat washer. So the easiest way to do this is to place the gasket in position, put one bolt through to hold it in place, and this should then stay where it is. Bring in another bolt with the same setup of the spring washer and flat washer, and again, place that through the hole to hold the gasket in place from the other side. Because it is rubber, it should hopefully hold both bolts in place. 
and then we can place it over making sure the shaft inside of the stepper motor goes into the coupler. What I should point out as well, there is a gap on the um, mount. Make sure the gap is either to the left or the right of the um, frame so you can access it. You don't want this pointing downwards because then you'll struggle if should you ever need to adjust the coupler. With it in place, you can then start to pinch up the bolts and also insert the other two remaining bolts on the bottom side. Now, because this is sitting on a rubber gasket, it is very easy to over tighten the bolts. So essentially you just want to pinch them up until you start to see the rubber compress. And then once all are feeling about the same tension, that's a good position to stop. Now inside of the housing, the bar has another flat area again. If I rotate that round, you should just be able to see it. Again, make sure this aligns with the smaller set screw. So just twist your lead screw a little bit until they align and then tighten the set screw up, followed by the larger one on top. So at this point, just take a second to turn the knob on the stepper motor and make sure the axis moves smoothly backwards and forwards and that there's no play in it. I'm installing the rubber feet with M5 20mm bolts. Now the instructions show this much further on into the process, but I'm installing them first because I'm worried about too much weight being on the machine later on in order to lift it up and try and get the rubber feet installed then. So next we are installing the gantry plates. Now these are not identical, there is a left and a right. The slot at the bottom of the plate will fit over this axis bar here and you want it pointing backwards towards the stepper motor. So when you put it in place on this slot, and it is sitting comfortably, as I say, it should be coming towards the back of the machine. We're going to hold these in place with some M5 20mm bolts and there are four for each gantry plate. So again, put them through, put it in position and begin to tighten them up and hold it in place. Repeat the process on both sides. I should say that I have found these threads a little bit tighter than some of the others. So do be careful when putting the bolts in not to cross thread them. If in any doubt, take the bolt out and just make sure that everything is clean and the cross threading hasn't begun to happen. Next, we are installing the X-axis gantry. Now, the instructions do say to leave a little bit of play in the end plates to slot this in. I think there is just enough flex to do this, which is why I have tightened these up. Obviously, if you are struggling, then you can release the bolts on one side just to give you that little bit of play. The other thing I should point out, obviously, this arrives wrapped in cling film with a little bit of oil on it. So do be careful when picking this up. It has got a bit of weight in it and it is also slippy. So yes, do be careful when handling it. You don't want to drop it. We will be installing this with M5 16 millimeter bolts. So let's get it in place first and then drop one bolt in position. On one end, the stem does stick out. So place this into the hole. And then as I say, there should just be enough flex in the plate to slide that in. Once in position, you can then use one of the M16 bolts and hopefully find the hole and then tighten that up. Now, obviously, if you do have a second pair of hands, someone to help you out doing this stage, I would strongly recommend it just to make sure everything is supported. Once you've got a couple of bolts in place, go around and get all eight bolts in position on either side plate and then begin to tighten them up. So with the main frame components in place, it is now time to check the squareness of the frame. Now you can check this at the start as well. And actually I do encourage you to check this at the start just to be safe. But obviously as we're adding extra components, there can be a tendency to possibly twist the frame. So this is the point that we will now check for squareness. The easiest method to do this is to simply take a tape measure, go from one corner of the frame, try and get in the center of the tape measure, and measure diagonally to the opposite corner. Mine is showing 98.1. And we will do the opposite corner as well. Again, placing that in the center. And again, check for square. It should be the same measurement, 98.1. So if both measurements are the same, then that is a positive thing. It means your frame is square. Given the structural integrity of this frame, the fact it's got end plates and then more supports in the middle, I wouldn't imagine it to move too much. If anything is out of square, obviously slacken some of the holding bolts off on the corners and just move the frame slightly to adjust it until it is square. Keep checking the diagonal measurements at each time you make an adjustment. 
Next we are going to install the x-axis stepper motor in exactly the same way that we did with the y-axis. We're going to start by installing the coupler. Again, this has a flat section on the thread. Make sure that aligns with the set screw on the coupler. Place it on until it hits the end of the lead screw. Then bring the Allen wrench in, tighten it up so that set screw connects with the flat section on the lead screw. Once you've pinched that up, then use the larger Allen key to tighten the clamping mechanism up on the coupler. And just like we did earlier, we put the gasket in place. We put a couple of M5 16mm bolts preloaded with a spring washer and a flat washer. I've put two in position to hold everything. So then you just slide it over again, making sure the stem of the stepper motor goes into the coupler. Once it is in position, just start to finger tighten the bolts up to hold everything where it needs to go. And once you've got a couple in, get the two remaining bottom ones in place. Then work your way around, pinching them all up. As I say earlier, it should just be enough to start to compress the rubber gasket, but not too much that you are over tightening everything. Again, make sure the flat bar on the stepper motor aligns with the little set screw. Once it is in position, tighten that up until it engages with that stepper bar. And then again, tighten the clamping bolt up. Once all is connected, again, just turn the knob and make sure that the X axis is moving as expected. And for a third time, we'll do the same thing, but this time installing the Z stepper motor, obviously on top of the Z assembly, again, using the M6, M5, M16 bolts. Next, we're going to install the 52 millimeter spindle mount, and we're going to do this not using the top set of holes, but the next one down. And we're gonna we use M5 12 millimeter bolts. So we'll put that in place, put it into the hole, and again, just give it a couple of turns to start to hold it. Bring another one in, place that in position to hold it, and pinch that up, and then continue and do the bottom two as well. Next, we're going to drop the spindle into the mount. Place it in. Now, if it is tight, just gently apply a little bit of pressure and wobble it until it moves all the way down. You want it about halfway down the spindle itself. So once it drops into position, use the M5 20 millimeter bolts, place those in, and again, start to pinch them up to clamp the spindle into position. Install the first of the X-axis limit switch plates. The tail should be pointing away. We're going to install these using M5 8mm bolts. And install the second plate on the opposite end, again using the same M5 8mm bolts. Install the Y-axis limit switches using the M3 20mm Phillips head bolts. Install the front Y limit switch using the M4 4mm bolts. And the same for the rear. At the time of recording this, the x-axis limit switch is not covered in the instructions. So I'm now fitting this in place using M5 12mm bolts as there appears to be a couple of spare ones in the set. Install the drag chain brackets. The larger one goes on the bottom using M5 16mm bolts. The smaller one goes on the side plate using M5 12mm bolts. Begin installing the drag chain from the rear of the Y axis. Use the M4 6mm bolt to hold this in place. Work round till you get to the next bracket and again use the same bolt to hold this in place and this secures the drag chain for the Y axis. Do the same on the X axis, again using the same M4 6mm bolt and then affix it to the top bracket. With the slats for the bed, start from the center and work your way out. Use the M5 25 mm bolts to hold these in place. Do one side, then the other, and then start to work your way out, holding all seven pieces in place. Position the dust baffles in place and use M5 18 mm bolts to hold these secure into the frame. It's now time to connect the wiring loom up. 
All cables are liable to mic this easier and also have male and female connectors to ensure they go into each other nice and secure. Connect the limit switches up, connect the stepper motors up which have slightly different connectors so again avoiding any confusion. Work your way around the machine ensuring all cables have been connected. Before moving on to the spindle spade connectors, push these in firmly and make sure the covers have been slid down over the top of them. On the opposite end of the wiring loom, we can start to connect this to the control box. The connectors will only go into each port one way, so just flip them over until they go in and it should go in nice and easy and click in place. Once all have been connected, we can then connect the spindle on the end. We can then connect the Z probe, connect the large connector to the back of the control box for the extension and then connect it to the main Z probe itself. Ensure the voltage is set correctly for your country, connect the power lead and also connect the USB cable. So ensure it's set to spindle mode which is this button in the raised position as it currently is. Turn your speed all the way up and also make sure the stop button is released so press it in, turn it to let it pop out and that is set. Clamp your material down, ensure it is tight and insert the USB stick into your laptop or PC. So well, with everything connected up, the USB cable and the USB stick both connected to your computer, what we're now going to do is allow the computer to talk to your CNC machine. So the first thing you'll want to do is open up the USB memory stick that you've just connected. If this doesn't show automatically, you can head over to this PC and then open up the USB drive. We are then going to head to driver, open up this folder. Now once you go to open this file up, you may get a security message pop up. Just click yes and continue through it. Then once this window appears, click install. Now I should point out the USB cable does need to be connected to the PC at this point or it may not work. So with everything connected, click install and let it run. It can take a few seconds, so just be patient and you will get the install success message. Click OK. Now we're going to quickly check that this has all installed correctly. So what we'll do is click on the Windows button and we're going to come down and type Device Manager. Once you see Device Manager, click and open this. And then we're going to look for the Ports menu and expand that out. And what we can see is something similar to what we just installed. USB serial CH340, so it looks very similar to what we've just installed over here. And we can see next to it, it says COM6. This is very important. You'll need to make a note of this COM number. You may have a different number. That is normal. Just keep a note of the number that yours says. We're going to close this down. We're going to close the installer down. And we're going to come back to the USB memory stick. We're going to go up one level, back to the area where all the folders are. Now you have a choice of software for running your machine. On the USB memory stick there is Candle and there is also UGS. My preferred option is UGS so we're going to go with that today. So we're going to open up the USG Windows file, obviously there is a Mac option as well. And we have a zip file. So what we want to do is extract everything out of this zip file. And to do that, we're going to right click on it. Now, if you have zip software installed, you may get options like this. If not, you can come down to open with and then come to Windows Explorer. Now, this gives us the folder with all the files and we want to extract this onto our PC. So we're going to click extract all and we're then going to find a place to save it. For now, for ease, I'm just going to save it under Documents and then click Select Folder and click Extract. Once that extracts, it will usually take you to the folder that you selected. If it doesn't, like it hasn't done here, we can just click onto Documents and head over to that area. And we can see UGS Platform Win. So we'll go into this folder and we've got a list of files here. We're going to head to the bin file and we've got two EXE files. Now, these are essentially your program to launch UGS. But before I open them, I should point out if you are struggling to run the files on the USB stick, you can head over to Google, type in UGS, and one of the first options that comes up is download UGS. Head over to this window, and then you've got a couple of options depending on what operating system you are running. Now back to the folder, I'm just going to click into UGS platform and open this up. 
Now, because I used UGS, it has loaded in my preferences in the way things are displayed. If yours doesn't look like this, don't worry. Any of these menus, such as jog control, can all be found up in the Windows section under these various menus, such as plugins and jog controllers. And all the windows can be swapped about and moved about, so you can just set things up how you like them. Now, if you remember a minute ago, we made a reference of the COM number that was important to us. Now, up the top here is your connection bar. And in this drop down menu, you want to select the COM number that is needed for your machine. If you don't see anything, click the refresh button and it will check all the COM ports available. Drop the menu down and select the one you need. Obviously, for me, it was COM 6. Now, the board rate by default will load as 115200. This is the correct number. Number. If yours shows anything different, then do change it to this number as say 115200. So with those in place, we'll now click on the connect button. And the machine is connected. We know this because everything has now come to life. Now, what you will notice straight away is we do have an alarm message. Do not be worried about this. This is standard when a machine has limit switches, which the 6050 plus does. So the first thing we want to do is come up to here and click unlock. And this now allows us to start operating the machine. So the first thing that I want to do is just check that everything is jogging about correctly. So we're going to come down here to the step size menu. Now this is effectively how far you want the machine to travel. So 50 will be 50 millimeters. Obviously you can change the increments and measurements. And we have the same for the Z. Now obviously these two measurements are different. Usually your Z measurement will be much smaller increments. We then also have the feed rate. This is basically how fast or slow you want the machine to travel. Keep this at a reasonable rate. I usually go somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000. So let's just check everything moves around as expected. First, we'll click left. And then we'll take it right. We'll go backwards. And then bring it forwards. And then same with the Z, take it up and take it down. Excellent. Everything is working. So the next thing we're going to do is set up the Z probe. Now you will see I have probe module open. If you don't have this, come up to Windows, come to plugins, and then come to the probe module and you'll see something like this. It may load up on one of the other tabs to begin with, but the first thing we're going to do is head to the Z option as we are just using a Z probe. Now the first thing we'll want to set is the thickness of the probe and ours came in at 19.08, so 19.08. Now the probe distance direction is how far we want it to travel down to try and find the Z probe plate. Now one thing I should point out here is if this is a positive number, it will raise the z-axis up we want it to lower it down that's why we have minus 10 so this will lower the z-axis down at 10 millimeters to try and find the plate if it doesn't find the plate it will flag up a warning alarm so it's always good to make sure the tip of your bit is near the probe plate itself. I will quickly show you these other settings available as well. These are con to control the rate at which it tries to find the plate. So you have a fast rate and a slow rate. It will find the plate quickly, touch it, raise it back up and then lower it down to slower rate to find it and ultimately get a more accurate reading. These are the default settings which I typically stick with. So we have 250 for the fast rate and 100 for the slow rate. Now we'll switch back to the Z probe and we'll also connect the Z probe to the machine. The alligator clip, the alligator clip goes to the bit and the probe goes underneath the bit. Now I can see the bit is sitting quite high above the plate, so I'm just going to lower it down until it is within 10 millimeters. Now what we can do is click the initiate probe and start the Z probe function. That has now set the correct Z height, so we can take that out of the way. The next thing we want to do is navigate over to the bottom left hand corner of the scrap piece of material that we've just put in place. I'm going to bring the increment measurements down to about 10 millimeters and quickly navigate over to the bottom left hand corner. 
So the reason I've done this, this is where I want the start of my test job to begin. And we need to tell UGS to remember this point. So we've just set the correct height for the Z. What we need to now do is tell it to remember the position for the X and the Y. So we're going to come up to machine. We're going to come down to actions and then we're going to come down to reset X zero. And then we're going to do the same again, but click reset Y zero. Now, ultimately, it remembers that position as the start job. And to test this, we can click return to zero and it should lower it down to the start point for the job. Perfect. Now, let's load in a quick test job. Now, on the USB stick itself, there are some files. So if we head into the files for Prover Excel, you'll have a load of test files in here. Now you can use these. I personally prefer to use a file I've created myself just for safety, but most of the files within here should work anyway. So I'm just going to minimize this. And what I'm going to do is come up to the open folder. And I'm just going to quickly navigate to where some of my test files are saved. And I've got one here called JD Test Logo Prover Excel. Now, I will put a copy of this available for people in the description area should you want to use this. Then we'll click Open. Now, what we can see on screen in the visualizer here, I'll just talk you through some of this. Obviously, it shows us the size of the file it is about to machine. It's also got some measurements around the outside, just to give you an indication of how big this is expected to be. We also have this little yellow arrow here. This indicates where the this indicates where the spindle actually is at the moment. And if I rotate this slightly round and see it from a flat perspective, we can see it is just touching at the top of the engraving area. And that's exactly where the spindle is at the moment. What we can see now rotated it is some lines as well. This is the travel path for what it will do in order to engrave the material. And then ultimately, the blue lines that you can see are what is actually going to be engraved. So that is everything set up and all that's left to do is click the play button and start the job. Obviously a very simple engraving and this machine is capable of so much more and we will be exploring that in the near future so keep an eye out for those videos. Now if there are any updates to the setup I will let you know in the description area below if science might change any of their instructions so keep an eye out for that as well. But today was just about getting everything set up and testing that it all works correctly which it did so positive result. Now I'm going to go away and tidy my workshop up because it is an absolute mess at the moment. Thank you all for watching. I hope you found it useful. And final thanks as always goes to my patrons. I will see you all on the next episode.